Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to do a quick study for the men. Uh, men's responsibility in marriage. Uh, some of you may know I've asked for prayer requests. Um, I, am, I have an espoused wife and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and uh, we're struggling with some things and trying to overcome some hurdles and we could really use your prayer but I started looking into it and I'm like before I got married, uh, espoused, and we're going to get into why I say married, um, you had to, I had to look into this, okay? And I advise all the single men out there who watch this to look into this further and really apply this to your heart and understanding of what your job is as a husband, what you're responsible for and what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. If you want to turn to 2 Samuel 3.14, we're going to talk about the word espoused and betrothed real quick. So you understand that a lot of the stuff we're going to be listing out here, some of it starts the moment you're betrothed. Okay. God takes marriage very, very seriously, and we'll talk about that. So, 2 Samuel 3.14. And David sent messengers to Ishboeth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michael, which I espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. And Ishabal sent and took her from her husband, even from Philtiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went with her along weeping behind her to Barum, then said Abner unto him, Go, return, and he returned. Okay, he espoused for a hundred foreskin of, of the Philistines. Um, he wanted Michael, uh, or Michael was supposed to be his wife, and Saul said, you know, the price is for a uh, um, for hundred foreskins of the Philistines, thinking that maybe the Philistines would kill David and he wouldn't have to. Um, but you see here, espoused to me, okay? Uh, let's look up the word espoused, okay? Betrothed, that's under the definition of espoused. Affianced, promised in marriage. By contract. Okay, that's what's going on here. Married. You mean a spouse can be married? Yep. United intimately. Embraced. Okay. Espoused. When you have an espoused wife, she still, God looks at it as your wife. Today, the lost world tries to use engagement. We're engaged. And it's just another way of saying we're dating, but we're a little bit more serious. Uh, no. Dating's not in the Bible. Uh, you, um... I understand courting's not in the Bible, but when you get to that point where in your fellowship with a woman, for men, because we're talking about men, with your fellowship with a woman, talking about the Word of God, and you decide, hey, I'm interested in marriage, he's interested in marriage, you both say yes, I want to be your husband, I want to be your wife, we want to get married, you, she is now betrothed to you. She's espoused to you. She is now your wife in God's eyes. You say that doesn't really explain it that much. We'll get on to some other verses, but let me go through betrothed real quick. Betrothed is contracted for future marriage. Okay, There's promised in marriage and contracted for future marriage. Okay. Deuteronomy 27. And what man is there that hath betrothed a wife and hath not taken her? Let him go and return into his house, lest he die in battle, and another man take her. A betrothed wife, uh, they haven't consummated the marriage. Um, they, it doesn't say they even did the ceremony, like, I'm going to do a marriage coverture. My wife and I are going to do a marriage coverture. But it says betrothed wife, a wife. Okay? Betrothed a wife, meaning she's his wife. But he's betrothed, promised in marriage, uh, married, united. They haven't been united intimately in this one. So it's another f showing that betrothed, a wife, when you're betrothed, God looks at that woman as your wife. And everybody else around you should be looking at that woman. That's his wife. Not, well, they're not technically married yet, so... And the lost world's like, she's free game. Uh, no, she's not. She's married. She's your wife. Exodus 21.9. Okay. Here's another example. 
And if he have betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. So a woman that's betrothed to, the, to a son, the father-in-law is to treat her as a daughter-in-law. You say, well, we haven't done the marriage coverture. We haven't done the little ceremony asking God's blessing. We haven't cons uh, gosh, consummated the marriage yet. doesn't matter. In God's eyes, you're being told that's your daughter-in-law. The moment your son is betrothed to her, that is your daughter-in-law, and you will treat her as such. God takes betrothal uh, espoused very seriously. Deuteronomy 22, 25, and the reason I'm doing this one real quick is to understand the seriousness of it. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. Now understand the force part. But notice it says betrothed damsel. And what's the punishment? Death. If you turn to Leviticus 20.10, let's look at another situation. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and adulteresses shall be put to death. Betrothed damsel. The guy forced himself on her, but it was also talking, I believe, about that's somebody's wife. Okay? The man messed around with somebody else's wife. God takes it very seriously. Now, to bring this home real quick, Matthew 1.18. See if a lot of you know where I'm going here. Turn to Matthew 1.18. This is the biggest example of being betrothed, and that woman's your wife, and you're to treat her as your wife. Until even, even past the ceremony, you still treat her as your wife when you do the marriage coverture and the consummation of the marriage, she's your wife, but you're to treat her as your wife from day one, the moment she's your espoused wife. Matthew 1.18 Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now wait a minute. Why would he have to put her away if they're not technically married? Because in God's eyes they are. And in his eyes, the man's eyes, that's his wife. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, in other words, don't put her away. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph raised from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had, had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Okay? They're espoused, and he took his wife. She's still called his wife, even though she's espoused. And we're going to read over in Luke 2 1 to find out she's still called his espoused. After this, this happens, She's still called his espoused wife. Okay. Luke 2 1. Turn over to Luke 2 1. And the point I'm trying to drive home, brothers in Christ, is when you're espoused to a woman, you're to look at her like she's your wife. And you need to treat her like she's your wife. Okay. There is no, well, technically she's not my wife. Not until we. Uh, do a ceremony and consummate the marriage. No, God looks at it as that's your wife, and you need to look at it as that's your wife. Luke 2 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. He's talking about the known world back then. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius, Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went. 
to be taxed every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. But we read over here in Matthew 1 that he took her as his wife. He didn't know her. They didn't consummate the marriage, but he took her. This is his wife. But over here, further down the road, she's still being called his espoused wife. Espoused, you're still, you're still considered a wife, and you're to look at her as a wife. Now, the marriage ceremony happens. I, then you, I bought a Bible for our uh, marriage coverture, and we consummate the marriage. She's now a wife. The espoused part gets dropped, and she's my wife, period. But the reason it's a spoused wife, promised wife, is God looks at that woman and says, that is going to be your wife. So you need to treat her as one. You need to treat her like she's your wife right now. Because that's going to be your wife. Now, this is important because I want you to realize that the whole point of this study is explaining a man's role in marriage according to the Bible and to get you brothers of Christ to say, hey, this is serious. Marriage is serious. Um, being espoused, uh, betrothed, having a betrothed, it's serious. This is very important because now I'm I might do a study relating this to how the body of Christ is related to the Lord. Okay. 1 Timothy, uh, actually Luke, yeah, 1 Timothy 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. One wife. Not multiple wives. One wife. 1 Timothy 3, 12. Let the deacons be the husband of one wife, ruling their children and their own house well. Once again, one wife. This is important. Titus 1.6 If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. One wife. Why is this important? Um... As a bride, we have one husband. But mainly this is here to let you know that polygamy, I think that's the right word, polygamy, is not biblical. You're to have one wife in the New Testament. Only one wife. Now, 2 Corinthians 11, 2, chapter 11, verse 2. The body of Christ is referred to as a chaste virgin. We're betrothed. We're um, espoused. To Jesus because he's relating the relationship to marriage so the marriage supper hasn't happened yet so that means we're not really married in other words you can lose your salvation uh, no the moment God saves you you are now espoused to Jesus Christ okay you cannot lose your salvation but look at this 1st Timothy 3 10 2nd uh, Corinthians 11 2 for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay? We are espoused to Jesus Christ. We are married. The marriage supper of the Lamb hasn't happened yet, but we are considered married. We belong to Jesus Christ. Just like your espoused wife belongs to you. It's your wife. Nobody else's. We belong to Jesus Christ. Okay. James 4.4 4. Can we commit adultery? James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. How can you commit adultery when it comes to Jesus Christ and you being espoused, be a friend of the world. So, if we're not really technically married, then how is that adultery? See, 
does it, it makes sense when you follow scripture with scripture and realize that when you're espoused, you're married. You're to look at that woman as your wife. Revelation 2.10, and we read up here, remember that when you're espoused to a woman, that woman's considered your wife until you die. And these people were like, if they die in battle, was it Deuteronomy 20, verse 7, lest he die in battle and another man take her. So when he dies in battle, then another man can take her. But as long as that man's alive and, he's and she's his betrothed, that's his wife. Nobody else's. Revelation 2.22, Behold, Revelation 2.22. i got to learn to take breaks to give you guys time to pause and turn to these because it's great to use your King James Bible and turn to these verses as we're going through them. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of, her de of their deeds. You know another way you can commit adultery when it comes to you and the Lord? Go over and start worshiping false gods. That's committing adultery. Your espoused husband is Jesus Christ. You're espoused to one husband, and that is Jesus Christ. And when you go to another husband, another man, another false god, in the scenario and the context we're talking about, you're committing adultery. Okay. And we'll get to that when it comes to our, when it comes to your marriage, brothers and sisters in Christ. But God takes marriage very seriously. He takes betrothal and espoused, when you have an espoused wife, very seriously. The lost world doesn't. It's just, they act like it's just another level in our dating. It's just, we're being a little bit more serious. We're getting a little bit, we're getting seriouser in our relationship. Uh, and a lot of those, if you look into the statistics, which I don't go off it too much, uh, a lot of people that get engaged don't stay married, or don't actually get married because they don't look at it as marriage because being engaged isn't marriage okay? uh, dating isn't biblical espouse and betroth are biblical and that when you do that then you're supposed to look at that man as your husband and that man's supposed to look at that woman saying that's my wife and I need to treat her as such which means you need and we'll talk about honoring her and part of the honor her part before you do is doing the ceremony, doing it right, a marriage coverture. You're honoring your wife. Um, you consummate the marriage. You're only with your wife. No adultery. There's other things where I'm skipping ahead, but I'm talking about you still do the marriage coverture to honor your wife and to honor God. Okay, showing him that um, it's important. It's an outward showing of how important it is that decision you two made. That's why you're supposed to have two witnesses before two or three witnesses. Um, so, let's get down to the meat of the study. Things a husband is responsible for and is supposed to do for his wife. 1 Timothy 5.8 We're going to go over two that you're supposed to do, but these two things seem to be all the lost world men seem to take. These two things and that's it. There's a lot more to marriage, men, brothers, and brothers in Christ. There's a lot more to marriage than these two things. Okay. So 1 Timothy 5.8 But if any provide not for his own, and I know that includes your kids and sometimes the elders to take care of when they're your responsibility, but your wife is also his own, because I know some women might get on to me for saying she belongs to you, to a man, that's your wife. Right here, if, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay. One of the things you're responsible, brothers in Christ, for your wife is you're to physically um, provide for your wife. You're to provide a home. And later down on down, when we talked about some other verses, not just any home, you're to provide her a godly home. You're to provide your wife with clothes. But not just any clothes, modest apparel and not the apparel of men. Modest apparel. Um, food, you're to provide food for her, but you need to do your best, and it's hard to, today when you get saved, to even when you're single, to start eating right. But you need to provide for her uh, good food for her to cook for the family, you know, healthy food. 
but you are responsible to provide for your wife. It's not the other way around. There's not, the wife is not supposed to be a career woman while the husband's working and bringing home a paycheck. Okay? But I don't want to get on the, woman, the wife's side. That'll be another study. But you husbands are responsible for providing for your wife. Ephesians 5.25, and the lost world goes, yes, yes, we agree with that, yes. Okay. Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Okay. You're supposed to protect your wife and it's going so far as to be willing to die for her. Jesus died for us brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, God, For God so loved, past tense, the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him. Okay. Jesus died and paid the price for sin as far as across the board. He died because the sins crossed the board. That's a whole other study because everybody says He paid the price for everybody's sin. No, He died for everybody's sin across the board. Okay. But you want that debt paid, you go to the cross. If not, then you still owe a debt. And you will have to pay up that debt at the great white throne judgment. But you've got to be willing to die for your wife. And you have men out there, the movies totally destroy what true marriage is and what true love is between a husband and wife. But they show those two things, where a husband's supposed to provide, and they even mock it sometimes because feminism is out of control in the movies and the media and everywhere. But the husband's to provide for his wife, and he's got to protect her to the point of willing to die for her, and even dying for her sometimes. Okay? These are two important things. But are these the only two things? Let's keep going. We're going to go to Proverbs 31.11, and I realize this is in the Old Testament, but there's instruction and righteousness here for a husband. Proverbs 31.11 the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. One of the things you've got to do, uh, husbands, is you've got to trust your wife. Um, trying to explain it is the best thing to do is you, you show your wife something and you trust her to get it done. Um, your wife comes to you and says, hey, we need this and this and this for the house. So you don't go follow behind her and go, hmm, do we really need that? Let me see. Okay, so yeah, I opened the cabinet. We're out of that stuff. Oh, we're out. You need to trust your wife, okay? She says, hey, we need this and this and this for the house. You trust her. Another situation is your wife takes $5 out of her pocket with a gospel track and gives that to a homeless man. You're not to go, what are you doing? You're not allowed to touch money anymore. And what are we going to You need to trust her, okay? Uh, you teach your wife to do something and because she's helping you out with stuff and you need to trust her. You've shown her. It might take her a little bit longer. Uh, she might find her own way of doing it and it gets done. It doesn't have to be your way. you got to trust her. The opposite of trusting your wife is controlling your wife, being controlling. Now, I understand that uh, a lot of women out there, when I was lost, professing Christian, if the man said, hey, no, we're not buying this, no, we're not, this is not coming into our home, uh, they might consider that controlling. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what the Bible's talking about here. The husbands, we're going to get to it, but we already talked about your home being a godly home, and it's your responsibility. Okay? If something wicked starts to come into your home, you're to tell your wife. Uh, your kids get old enough that they start bringing it in. You tell them it doesn't come into this house, and that's not controlling. That's you doing your job as a husband protecting your family spiritually as well as physically. Okay. Jump down to verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. As a husband among the brethren, are you known as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man? Among your neighbors in the lost world, are you known as a King James Bible believing for English speaking people, and that's what I am, God fearing man. Are you known as a true Christian? It's something to think about. 
Okay, you're supposed to be known in the gates. Okay. Jump down to verse 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Okay. Are you pray you, you need to praise your wife. Okay, the verse before this, I didn't put it down, talks about when she does things great, you praise her. Uh, the house is always clean. You give, you don't praise her once. You praise her all the time. Honey, this place is amazing. It's you do a lot of hard work, honey. I thank you so much for keeping this house clean. Oh, honey, you cooked a great meal. It's amazing. Oh, you gave that homeless man five dollars in a gospel track. Uh, that's amazing. You did a great job, honey. Praise your wife. It's very important that you do this, because when the opposite of when you don't praise your wife, it feels they can start to feel like you're taking them for granted. It's important to praise your wife. Jump down to verse 31. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Okay, you need to empower your wife to do the fruits of her hands. Okay, what that means is is talks about how an idle wife is bad and we'll get to that but you're supposed to empower her she's learning how to cook she says she needs this for the kitchen she needs that for the kitchen so she can cook these elaborate meals or just cook from scratch and that I've been trying to cook from scratch and I'm, I already tell people I'm not the best cook in the world um, but it takes longer and I had to end up going down because I used to do microwavable stuff then when I started cooking fresh stuff and everything I had to start going down to the store and getting kitchen stuff that I didn't have okay you gotta empower your wife you gotta make sure she has what she needs to have uh, hobbies um, my wife that's coming out here wants to learn how to can food uh, dry meat uh, dry um, vegetables dry fruit um, bag them so they last longer uh, she loves gardening wants to do a garden and I want to do a garden with her and grow our own food. You need to empower your wife to the fruits of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. An example I have is, is you take food to a neighbor. She take, okay, I can tell my neighbor or my family member that my wife has a great garden. We build a garden. But when the neighbor or family member comes over and sees it and tells others, that's her own works praise her in the gates. Let her own works praise her in the gates. She's supposed to have good works. Okay, you don't want an idle wife at all. You want to empower her not to be idle. And yes, the worst thing you can ever do is have cable and have a big TV in your living room. I use little TVs for my computer monitor. But you don't want her idle because a wife that's idle tends to get in trouble. And I'm finding out uh, even for you and me, brothers, sisters, or brothers in Christ, uh, when we get idle, sometimes we can get in trouble because that's when the temptation comes in. When the wife gets idle, that's when uh, Satan goes after her. She needs to stay busy doing the work of the Lord, and part of that work is being a keeper at home. So, what we've got here is provide. You're to provide for your wife. You got to be protector to the point of willing to die for her. You got to trust your wife. You gotta be known in the gates as a Bible believing, God fearing man, and known in the gates as being a good husband. Okay. Uh, and to praise your wife. To empower your wife to get things done, to do things, whether they be hobbies like art, uh, sometimes gardening when it comes to flowers and plants. Uh, you need to empower her to do things. Okay. And then the fruits of her hands. Will, be, will praise her in the gates because people are going to see it. 1 Corinthians, actually Ephesians 5.25. Don't want to skip it. Ephesians 5.25. We talked about it, but this time we're going to read 26 with it. Okay. Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. One of your responsibilities, uh, husbands, 
is you're supposed to protect your wife spiritually and wash her by the watering of the word. You need to be reading the Bible, okay? Husbands, you are to protect and provide for your wife spiritually. How? First thing you do is make sure she has a good Bible, King James Bible. Um, after that, you read the Word with her, and you motivate her to read the Word. And you shouldn't have to if you're married. That's why you marry a Bible-believing, God-fearing woman. But you, sh someone brother told me this once, and I agree with him. Okay, start each day reading the Bible together, and end each day reading the Bible together. Okay, stay in the Word together. And it'll help motivate her to stay in the Word even when you're not reading the Word together. Okay? You need to pray together. You need to sing hymns together. Mm -hmm. You can even sing psalms. <laughs> I, I did that. I did a video about that. But some of you know that's been following God's ministry that He's allowed me to be part of. Um, but yeah, singing hymns together. Teach your wife and provide her with the KJV, a King James Bible for English-speaking people. Um, but you are responsible, husbands, to provide for your wife spiritually and protect her spiritually. In other words, uh, you don't you you protect her from wolves in sheep's clothing, false converts. Okay, I can get into the woman's side where she's supposed to reverence her husband and submit herself to her husband, which you are wives. But husbands, you're the when she does that, you are responsible, and God holds you responsible for protecting your wife spiritually. Something, if you let something into the home that's evil and wicked, you're the one that's going to have to answer for it. Because she's submitting herself to you. And don't get me wrong, wives, this is going to be in the wife study. You're still supposed to make sure, and we're going to get to this with the men, that you're pleasing God over pleasing your husband. But you're still to submit yourself to your husband. But husbands, because of that, you are responsible to take care of her physically and spiritually and to protect her physically and spiritually. The lost world doesn't do this. Like I said, they stop at, um, I love you so much, I'm willing to die for you. Um, and I'll provide for you. And that's where they end it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more that the Bible says to being a husband and wife. 1 Corinthians 7, chapter 7, verse 2. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, that's the key there, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, the wife. Okay. I looked up the word benevolence. The disposition to do good, goodwill, kindness, charitableness, the love of mankind. Okay. You're supposed to do good by your wife and be kind to your wife and charitable to your wife. Love your wife. Okay. Another one is accompanied with a desire to promote their happiness. That's the big one there too. Benevolence. Okay. Uh, the wife is going to want to make her husband happy and the husband's going to want to make her wife happy. But remember, God holds the husband accountable for his home. Okay, that's why we're going to read 1 Corinthians 7.32. The warning to the husband. It's not to the wife. It's to the husband. This warning. But I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay? The word is do benevolence up at the top. Do benevolence. You give her kindness. But also understand here the warning that's given that we're supposed, as men, we're supposed to please God first when it comes to our home and how we do things. We're supposed to do it according to His Word, and we're supposed to please God first. Our wives second. That's the great warning, and that's the trap that it's going to be, not trap, that's what's going to be difficult for you brothers and out there that are married, you already know this, I'm going to be new to this, but you're supposed to please the Lord first, your wife second. But that's what it's talking about, the benevolence is, you know, wanting to please your wife. 
as long as it doesn't go against the word of God and it is profitable to do all that is in you to please your wife. So one of the things that is your responsibility is to please your wife as long as it doesn't go against the word of God and is profitable. People say, what do you mean by profitable? Um, there's times where pleasing your wife is probably going to hurt the household. It's not a sin, but it's going to end up hurting the household. Okay. Biggest situation is um, the refrigerator works just fine. Let's say the piping's going bad in the house and you're getting some leaks here and there and you need to replace a whole section of pipe. You have to have someone come do it because you don't know how to do it. It's under the house. And she's like, I want a new refrigerator. I want a new refrigerator. Well, you can please your wife and buy a new refrigerator. It's not a sin. But then you wouldn't have money to fix the piping under the house. You see what I'm talking about being profitable? I have no problem with my wife's giving her all that she wants and I'll be lacking in a heartbeat. All I need is this. My, the ministry guides let me be a part of and there's things, there's certain things I like to do that's joyful, but I will spend money on my wife first, making sure she has nice dresses that she likes. I can wear old jeans. It doesn't bother me. I have no problem pleasing my wife but make sure that you're not going against God's word and that it is profitable. The other part of that verse is you're not to withhold yourself from your wife, talking about intimacy. You should always do your best to never go to bed angry at your wife. You can still disagree and, and discuss the topic or situation the next day. But one thing you need to work on, brothers in Christ, as a husband, and I understand the wives do, but this study is directed at the husband, is you don't want to get mad at your wife to the point where you're telling her don't touch me I don't want to be with you okay later on we're going to get to the verse where it talks about bitter you're not supposed to be bitter towards your wife have bitterness in your heart towards your wife okay you are not to withhold yourself from your wife next we're going to 1 Corinthians 5:28. And the easiest way not to go to bed angry is back to what I said. Read the Bible, every, start your day with the Bible, end your day with the Bible. Start your day with praying with your wife, end your day with praying to your wife. And you both can pray, God help us to calm down because we love one another. And whatever we're, normally what we're arguing about, sometimes it can be important, but it's not important enough for you guys to start getting bitterness in your heart towards one another. Okay? Praying, reading the Word of God, singing hymns. Okay. before you go to bed at night and in the mornings. 1 Corinthians 5.28 So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherish it, even as the Lord the church. For we are the members of his body, of his flesh. Remember, your, your wife and you are one flesh. She's flesh of my flesh, bones of my bones. My uh, wife jokes around saying, I'm, I'm his rib. I'm, I'm his rib. <laughs> I love her to death. Or, oh, that's a bad statement. I love her very much. And of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now I believe here what it's talking about is how you physically treat your wife, and verbally. Uh, you don't treat your wife in a way that you don't want to be treated. You don't beat your wife. You don't verbally abuse your wife. Okay, You're to love her as you love yourself. Now, it goes back to empowering her. Um, to do things that's good for her, hygiene, um, hygiene products, uh, healthy food, okay, you want to eat healthy food, so you want to make sure you provide it for her, but mainly the two biggest things that I'm mainly pointing out here with this verse is you are not to physically abuse your wife. You're not to verbally abuse your wife. I put on here yell, you're not to yell at your wife. So, you're to love your wife as you love your own flesh. You don't treat her in a bad way that you wouldn't want to be treated. This is very important. 
God takes it seriously how you treat your wife and how you do the things you're supposed to do for your wife. Okay. And yes, it can get as bad. And with a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, I'm not saying it's going to get this bad, but there's some women out there that are so passive because they're verbally broken and some of them are physically abused. And it gets to the point where the guy has all the good stuff and she doesn't. I'm talking about clothing, food, lack of food and stuff like that. It can get that bad. But brothers and sisters in Christ, brothers in Christ, as husbands, you're not to do that. You're not to physically abuse your wife, and you're not to verbally abuse your wife. You're to treat her as you would treat yourself. And you get her the nicest clothes, dresses, the nicest winter dresses, the nicest summer dresses, what you can afford. I'm not talking about spending thousands of dollars, but you want her to look nice. You want her to eat right. Okay? You want to look nice. All my jeans, I had two nice jeans, and they're getting holes in them. I don't know if you can see it. I guess you can't. And I accidentally got excited about a project I was doing, and I wore my good jeans when I was staining, and I got some stain paint on the legs of my pants. So right now, I don't have a good, great pair of jeans. I don't. Okay. But remember how you treat your wife. Let's turn to the next part. Colossians 3.19. Here we're going to talk about the bitterness part. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Notice it says love your wives and that tells you how to love your wife. Everything we're talking about is you, the husband, the saved, sinner, Bible-believing, God-fearing man. How, this is all about how you love your wife. And be not bitter against them. This is another verse about your words uh, having bitterness in your heart that turns into anger, and that anger can build up and turn into hate. Okay? And that bitterness can show through your physical actions and your verbal, the words you use. Okay? This goes back to being physically and verbally abusive. You're not to be bitter against your wife, but it goes farther than that in the sense that you're not supposed to be bitter in here. If you truly love your wife, you're not going to be bitter against her. Okay, Don't fall in that trap. I did a video, video on bitterness, and um, I'll link it below. Don't fall into the trap of being bitter towards your wife. You don't want that in your heart. You do not want bitterness growing in your heart. It's like a disease. <laughs> That's a good way to say it. Uh, a virus, anything like that. It just, once it starts, it's going to start growing. And you got to get that out of your heart ASAP. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. I think I talked about this in another study where... Um, if you don't honor your wife, your prayers are going to be hindered. Your, lo your house is going to be in disarray, and you're going to be fighting with your wife, and uh, you're going to start being distracted, and your prayers are going to get less and less, and you realize you're not praying as much as you used to. Your prayers might stop completely. Okay. But let's talk about the honor part. There's two sides to this, I believe. You're honoring your wife by doing two things. Honor. The esteemed, this definition, honor, the esteemed due or paid to worth, high esteem. It goes back to praising your wife, but you give right your wife credit where credit is due, and you honor her. You don't say, you don't, if she did something great, you don't say, yeah, we did this and we did great. Or you don't say, yeah, I think I did pretty good and take credit for it. You honor your wife. But the big point here that I believe for you husbands, when it comes to honoring your wife, reputation. Another definition for honor. Reputation, good name, as his honor is unsullied. How you act and how the brethren slash lost world sees you, you need to make sure that you're honoring your wife with your actions. Making your home a godly home. All of this ties together. Your actions, you need to honor her with your actions, providing what she needs to get stuff done, praising her when she does good things, 
and making sure your home is a godly home. Also, you don't go out and get drunk and have people see you. You don't go to the bars. You don't go to the movie theaters. You don't do things where the lost world looks at you and goes, I thought he was a Christian. And you dishonor your wife that way. Because they're going to look at her and they're going to be able to mock her and put her down because of your actions. They now look at her as being less because of what you did. I always talked about this when it comes to sin and you get married. There's no longer, okay, it's my sin. It's not hers, it's mine. Uh, yes, you're going to have to answer for it. But the physical repercussions of that sin, you're going to be sharing with your wife. And vice versa. There is no longer, okay, I did this, you don't have to, it's not going to affect you at all. Uh, it's going to affect your wife, brothers. It's going to affect your wife. You need to honor her by be having good reputation, a good name, and make sure you're unsullied. That you're doing right. You're following the word of God. You're doing what's right according to the Lord, and you're going to be honoring your wife. Okay. So make sure you're honoring your wife so it doesn't hinder your prayer. It's going to hinder your walk with the Lord. You want your walk with the Lord to be strong when you're married? Love your wife. How do you love your wife? Everything we've been talking about. Okay, lastly, and we talked about it a little bit up front because God takes this seriously. If When it comes to us and our relationship with the Lord, if we turn around and start having idols, and false gods were committing adultery. The quickest and number one way you can destroy your marriage and destroy your walk with the Lord is committing adultery. Proverbs 6.23, if you want to turn there. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. In other words, you got to be nuts. you got a beautiful wife that you love at home. Why are you doing that? You gotta be crazy, you know. He lacketh understanding, but here is the big time that should be put the fear in you, brothers. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Okay? You destroy your marriage and you destroy your walk with the Lord, you destroy your own soul. Do not, do not commit adultery. I had to throw that in there because that's something you do not do. Now, I'm going to go back over everything real quick. We talked at the beginning how God takes marriage seriously, being betrothed, um, espoused, and being betrothed. He looks at you as that's your wife, and you need to treat her like you're, she's your wife. Right? That's why I don't believe you should be betrothed for, you know, years and years, six months, the moment you decide you're going to get married, you need to do what is possible and do what is necessary, and sometimes it might take longer. But the whole point is, is that's your wife, and here's your responsibilities. You say, well, we haven't done um, the marriage coverture, and we haven't consummated the marriage. I already showed you that that doesn't mean you're not married. That doesn't justify you just turning around and leaving and saying, oh, I've changed my mind. That doesn't justify you breaking up and going and finding another man, you know, committing adultery. So, we talked about that. God takes it very seriously. And so should you, single men out there, that are looking for a God-fearing wife. And I didn't mention this in here, but you make sure that she lines up with the Bible with her beliefs. And the Bible, we talked about how you, husbands, you're not to withhold yourself from the wife, and the wife's not to withhold herself from you. Yes, a physical attraction is going to be there, and it's important. But also, the foundation. Is her foundation a rock? Okay. So let's go down through everything we talked about. First, husband of one wife. Jesus is our husbandman, and he's one husband. Uh, we're one wife, the body of Christ. Um, Individually, I'm one wife. So, one wife, husband of one wife, we talked about. So, number one, provide for your wife physically and spiritually. Two, die for your wife, protect your wife physically and spiritually. And if you, it gets to the point where you have to die for your wife, you're to die for your wife. And one thing I left out earlier was husbands, 
I'll direct this at the wives, but wives out there, I've had wives tell me, and the woman I love with my heart, and I love with my actions that we're talking about here, the ones I can do until I get her here, um, they'll say, well, I'd die for you too, honey. That's not the job of the woman. God said the husband is supposed to be willing to die for his wife, to save his wife's life. Both of you should not be struggling to fight to get in the way of the bullet, like someone's going to shoot, and you're both fighting. No, no, I'm getting in front. No, I'm... no, it's the husband's responsibility to die for his wife. Okay, three, trust your wife. you got to learn to trust your wife. She says she needs this. We talked about it. you got to trust your wife. And trust, and like I said, until she loses that trust, but that's whole something is. But you need to start out by trusting your wife, not being controlling and watching her every move because she's got to do it your way and a specific. No, you got to trust your wife. If she gets the job done and she does it her way, she gets the job done. Trust her. Four, you're to praise your wife. Thank you, honey, for what you do. I so much appreciate everything you do for me, honey you do for our home, how you back me up when it comes to the Word of God, when it comes to keeping our home a godly home. Honey, you look amazing in that dress. I don't care what the lost world says about women wearing dresses today. You look amazing, honey. Thank you, thank you for not wearing the apparel of men and dressing modestly for your husband and for God. Five, be known at the gates. Bible-believing, God-fearing man, be known at the gates, and that also goes with um, honoring your wife. You're supposed to be known as a good man, a good husband. Okay. Six, empower your wife to do what she needs around the house and hobbies, to not be idle. Provide her the things she needs to get stuff done. All right. You need to empower her to have fruits to do the works of the fruits of her hand. Uh, number seven, very important, washing your wife with the word daily. You need to stay in the word with your wife. Do Bible studies with your wife. Read a chapter in the morning together before you get out of bed even. Read a chapter at night when you go to bed together. Um, I have a brother in Christ, I think it's Brother Brian at King James Famous. He talked about how... Um, he'd read two verses, she'd read two verses, he'd read two, and they'd go back and forth, and if it was an odd number, uh, there was one verse left, the very last verse they'd read together, because they're trying to involve each other together when it comes to your husband washing your wife by the word daily. Okay. Um, I do cue cards, uh, memory verses, when I walk on the beach. I was walking on the beach with my espoused wife, and I was going through saying, you know, reading the little words here and there. She's like, oh, yeah. And she'd get a lot of them right. And she told me later that she loved that. It was amazing sitting on the beach, walking with her, and going over the memory verses as we were hunting stuff on the beach. Okay, wash your wife with the word daily. This needs to be your foundation for your marriage, as well as your walk with the Lord, as well as your home. The word of God needs to be your foundation. Eight. Giving your wife due benevolence. Nine, do not withhold yourself from your wife. Don't get so angry, and we'll get to the part about not being bitter. Um, don't hold bitterness in your heart. Don't be so angry with your wife all the time. You can, you can disagree with her, and like I said, we'll get to the wife's side about her submitting herself to her husband, but you are responsible for everything, but you are not perfect. You're going to make mistakes where your wife needs to have grace for you, but you know what that means? Husbands, you need to have grace for your wife, charity for your wife, patience with your wife, grace, okay? Do not get bitter. Don't let bitterness grow in your heart. Don't get angry, like angry, angry with your wife. Verse 9, do not withhold, like we did that. Like I said, physically, you're not to withhold yourself. Your body's not your own because you're one flesh. Okay. Ten, do not physically or verbally abuse your wife. It goes back to what we were talking about when it comes to benevolence and praising your wife. Your words should be words of encouragement. 
and encouraging your wife to stand for the Word of God, to do things God's way, you encourage your wife to dress modestly, you encourage your wife to wear dresses, you encourage your wife by saying with cooking and her hobbies and just living for the Lord, you encourage your wife to memorize scripture, to read the Word of God with you, to sing hymns, to pray. You're to encourage your wife. Your words are so important to your wife. I'm learning the hard way that I slip up and say things the wrong way or I say things I shouldn't and I screw up and I thank the Lord that she has grace for me and that she forgives me when I screw up. But words are very important to your wife. We're not going to be perfect, but you should strive to always have good words for your wife. Do not verbally abuse your wife. And that should come with saying that you shouldn't physically abuse your wife either. At all. You should never hit your wife at all. all right. 11. Honor your wife. There's lots of ways you can honor your wife, but the obvious ones are you're not supposed to be a drunkard. You're not supposed to be a drug addict. You don't commit adultery. That's a big way of destroying your marriage and dishonoring your wife and dishonoring God. But the best way that you can honor your wife is, be, is make sure you're doing your best to keep your walk with the Lord strong, to obey His word, and make your home a godly home. You're providing for your wife. You're praising your wife. You're honoring her for what she does but you also honor her by what you do in your actions, everything here that we've talked about. Okay? Making your home a godly home. And do not commit adultery. Doing all these things, these 12 things that I mentioned, and if I forgot something, brothers in Christ, please throw it down at the bottom. Sisters in Christ, throw it down at the comment section. But when you say, I love you, honey, to your wife, this is what you should mean. I love you, and I show it with action, all 12 of these things. Okay. Love is a physical act as well as your words. They go hand in hand. They are not by themselves. So, I hope this has helped you brothers in Christ that are married, and I hope this has encouraged those who are single or getting married um, to have a betrothed wife, in other words, you have a wife, but you're bet she's your betrothed, if I can say the word right, that this has encouraged you to stay in the word and realize that there is a lot to being married. It's a big change in your life. To me, it's a good change. But like I said, the warnings when it comes to being married is you trying to please your wife over the Lord, over His word. Um, so... With that being said, um, stick to the Word of God. Your household will run great, and you'll have a lot of peace and joy, husbands, if you're doing all these things for your wife. To your wife, for your wife, and you're not doing the things you're not supposed to. Okay? And your home will be a good home, a godly home. It's not going to be perfect, but it will do, do pretty good. Okay? I thank you for watching and taking the time, and remember that I love my brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. See you in the next video.